My first 30 days as a CIO, the series, is over. And if you were mentorship starved enough to try to digest two and a half hours of my incoherent ramblings in a couple of sittings, which the analytics tell me many of you were, well, you deserve a palate cleanser. So here's what we're going to do for the next series, a CIO book club. Wasn't my idea. And what do we do when something is not our idea? Thank you, Mammoth Caveman, for suggesting it in the comments. Now, I've never hosted a book club virtually with strangers, so it's probably going to suck. But what do I always say? If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. The book. And remember, I'm picking one that will teach you how to be a better CIO. The book, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Take a minute to let that soak in. I didn't pick it because it's being taught in all the best business schools. It's not. And they're mostly useless anyway. I didn't pick it because it obviously holds great business insights. We'll find out together if it does. I chose it for the same reason I'd pick any classic. Reading is a collaboration with the author. It's an opportunity to build character, yours. Martin Seligman, the pen professor who coined the term learned helplessness, wrote a book called Character Strengths and Virtues with Chris Peterson. And they talk in that book about the virtues that I think we connect with when we read great literature. Virtues that I talked about in the new CIO series. Virtues that make you a better CIO. Curiosity, kindness, bravery, perseverance, hope, gratitude, fairness, humility. So when we read the classics, and Project Hail Mary will be a classic one day, we can apply what we learned from those virtuous characters and virtuous actions. We can apply them to how to be better at work. We should immerse ourselves and enjoy the character's journey and know that their choices resonate with us because of our shared values. In other words, reading reinforces the importance of living a virtuous life at work and play. Okay, enough of the preachy stuff. If you've already read, Project Hail Mary, like I have, then you can read it again, like I'm about to. But this time, you'll hopefully read it to learn something instead of just being wildly entertained. If you want to do the book club in real time with me, you have a week to prep. So you will need to have chapters one through five read soon. After that, we'll go in like five chapter chunks every two or three days. That might sound aggressive, but when... I read it the first time. I couldn't put it down. So every couple of days might actually be slowing you down. The format, given that I hate spoilers, will be me starting a stitchable segment for each five-chapter chunk. I'll kick it off with something lame like, CIO Book Club, what did you learn from Project Hail Mary chapters one through five that makes you a better leader? I know, it's, it's like dad-level lame, but... After that, I'll tell you what I learned. Also lame. Ditch what you learn or any feedback. And don't worry about being lame. The finest people I know are boring. Anywho, I'll stitch you back if it makes sense. Or if you're not into stitching, I'm pretty engaged in the comments section. Final note, I didn't link to the book on Amazon or Audible. One, because it'll look like I'm trying to make a book off you. And I'm not. And two, because... You should first try your local library, then an independent bookstore near you. And if both of those fail, go to the author's website and buy it from them. Okay, looking forward to some quality time with you and Rylan Grace. I'll start this new book club, tentatively titled CIO Up, Up, Down, Down, Left, Right, Left, Right, BA. I'll start with a quick confession. I full on laughed from page one onward even on my second read-through, from that very first question, you know, what's two plus two? My answer, and remember, I intend to use what we're reading in this club to tease out how to be a better executive, a better CIO. So the executive lesson behind what is two plus two? It's a metaphor for the low bar we unintentionally set in business because of the constraints of business convention. An example would be the low bar around the practice of interviewing candidates. I'm 
pretty confident that lots of people you don't know who have little to no relevant experience and who probably are average performers at best at their current job could talk their way into your open rec. Because at some point in the history of modern business, we put all our chips on interviewing as the qualifying process. And we put a legal framework around not talking about candidates between companies. The whole process is a low bar that many executives think they can overcome by training the interviewer. Talk about constrained thinking. So whether you're looking for the right candidate or you're looking for a career change, my first bleary-eyed business-related thought from literally page one of the book is that it doesn't matter what two plus two equals. Well, the math doesn't matter, which would drive Ryland nuts. It only matters that the answer, the verbose answer, tells a relatable, recallable, preferably humorous story. And that might be tragic from the hiring manager's perspective, but it's also instructive to anyone looking for a career change. Learn to tell a good, funny story. And what's the best way to learn? Read a good, funny story. What leadership lessons did you learn from the first five chapters of Project Hail Mary? I'll go first. Hi, clearly a different person here. You can tell, you know, by this action. I think we can all agree. Rylan's waking up, his tequila state of mind, and how he's treated by that robot arm is every company's new employee onboarding process. You know, with the exception of mine. It's the beginning of any job at a new company. It's disorienting, a whirlwind of new information, new organizational dynamics, new expectations. It, honest to God, tests your character, your adaptability, your resilience, your patience, which is why even when we don't relate to him, we all ad admire Ryland. He's driven by his curiosity. He embraces uncertainty. He has a learning mindset. He's a character with real character. In the real world, it wouldn't matter where Ryland works or what his role is. He's going to lead with curiosity and humor. That's a callback. What leadership lessons did you learn from the first five chapters of Project Hail Mary? I'll go first. Hi, older fan. Same darn graphic though, really. Okay, I love that Ryland teaches kids for a living. If, if you're going to be a leader in any industry, it's almost mandatory when anyone hands you the mic to talk about culture and purpose. But it's mostly hokey, right? Purpose-driven leadership done well in theory is supposed to increase employee engagement, productivity, retention. But most employees know better. They're adults who probably made a bad decision with their career, choosing money over meaning. If they were purpose-driven, they wouldn't be at that company or in that role. They'd find a company that aligns with their values, like I did. Probably get paid less than the big guys with purpose-driven leadership. And they'd be living their values every day in a company and role that aligns with their purpose. That's Ryland, teaching kids for a living. That's him saving humanity. The mission didn't give him purpose. It allowed him to express his purpose. As a CIO, as an aspiring leader, you need to take his lead. What leadership lessons did you learn from the first five chapters of Project Hail Mary? I'll go first. Hey, I'm trying that new redhead filter. Don't worry, I'm going to expense this whole thing. Let's talk Astrophage, the interstellar mole that plays the villain in the book. My favorite kind of villain. Just living its best life, unaware, like Bob in accounting. My thesis for the rest of this book club is that astrophage is a metaphor for business complexity. Maybe even for VUCA. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. My first proof point is the character Strat. By the way, if you're a traditional manager, you shouldn't be identifying with Rylan. You should be identifying with Strat. Envious of the amount of power she has and how she wields it. A little business side note. On Strat, at least, what makes her effective is that government power the highest ranked power in the book gave her a rank higher than them. 
she is the most empowered single threaded leader in that fictional world. Every PM's fantasy. But back to my thesis, that astrophage is complexity. One way we know this, Strat explicitly says she hates complexity, the arch enemy. She's perfect for the gig because Strat is short for strategy. Okay, that's a stretch. What leadership lessons did you learn from chapters six through 10 of Project Hail Mary? I'll go first. And I'm going to go out of sequence covering chapter nine before I jump back into six, seven, and eight in the next couple of videos. Because chapter nine is momentous. It introduces everyone's favorite character, Rocky, quite literally the engineer to Ryland's scientist. But let me make this about business. I think of Rocky, metaphorically, as an engineer without business depth. Ryland's strength is science, which in our metaphor is business knowledge. He knows the science version of business information, like clients, products, markets, and how they interrelate. Ryland, in this unlikely pairing with Rocky, is the business. He's the business user. He's, he's not particularly techie. As one of the members of the book club, Mike, pointed out, Ryland's not particularly adept at technology on the ship, the whole robot arms thing. Ryland sciences everything. He systematically studies, experiments, observes, the business equivalent of which would be like client voice, client journey, product development. And he sciences, not because his curiosity demands it, it does, but because on some level, he knows, like we all know, that that's how the universe separates protagonists from lovable side characters. In the world of business, that's how the universe separates waiters from chefs. Business depth. As much as I love Rocky, he's a waiter. He has to wait for Ryland, the chef, to tell him what to do, what to build. And don't get me wrong, Rocky, as a prototypical engineer, tries to and does pick up business depth, earth science in the, in the book, and that makes him a better engineer. That's instructive on two levels. The path to better engineering, get deep with business knowledge, and the path to the C-suite, because there are no waiters in the C-suite, only chefs. Chapter six introduced the Petrova line. It's a trail of astrophage that goes from the sun to Venus. Two immediate lessons for CIOs. One, you need to be constantly monitoring for anomalies. And when you find them, two, you need to take some immediate action with limited information as your team figures out how to get more complete information. Usually that action you take is transparent communication with all stakeholders and the mobilization of everyone needed for the response. Now, I could go into that, but I covered that in the first 30 days of a new CIO series. So I'm going to cheat here and bring in a problem that I started to talk about last week where I criticized interviews as the qualifying process to landing a job at a new company. Because interviewing is a great example of needing to take action with limited information. So what are your options if you want to play within those constraints? Answer, get comfortable with the 37% rule from another book, Ryan Christian's Algorithms to Live By. If you haven't read it, the 37% rule employs what's called the optimal stopping problem. Imagine that you want to hire a BA and you have a pool of 100 applicants to choose from. The question is, how many interviews should you conduct before making the decision, before being ready to make the decision? How do you balance between exploring options FOMO, fear of missing out, and committing to the best BA when you haven't maybe talked to all 100. Well, you do what Ryland would do. You use math, which suggests that you, the interviewer, should allocate the first 37 of your interviews to familiarize yourself with the talent pool and figure out the qualities that you're looking for. It's a bar you're setting as opposed to, you know, relying on all the generic garbage that's in a job description. And that bar is important because after those initial level setting interviews, you've set the bar, you should choose the next best applicant who appears better than that bar after that initial 37%. That's a great example of how to leverage science, Weiland's whole shtick, to take immediate action with limited information. 
or as immediate action as is possible. Chapter 7 was all about astrophage behavior. And as you heard me say last week, astrophage is my metaphor for business complexity. As a CIO, consider the parallels between astrophage and the systems you manage. There's hidden complexity in astrophage and your architecture. Both have emergent behavior, necessary to mention of complex system. Emergent behavior is a big word, but it just means that complex systems have unpredictable outcomes. That's partly because of interconnectedness, whether that's the astrophage or your systems, but it basically means that your explanation for a lot of failures within your systems will be unforeseen circumstances or your version of saying that. We'll keep coming back to this throughout the whole book, but fundamentally, there's a ton of evidence that complexity demands adaptive strategies, agile responses to changing tech, changing business needs. And the whole art of Project Hail Mary is about adaptive strategies to emergent behavior. If I knew any other big words, I'd throw them in right here. Look, it's fun reading a piece of science fiction through the lens of business. It becomes clear, at least for me, that it's never enough to understand competitive threats or client slash market behavior at the surface level. It needs to be thorough, deep, iterative, and it needs to consider long-term effects of both action and inaction. It needs you to consider the interconnected nature of all the systems that make up your problem. Ryland is all about learning, which is why I love the character. And he's also about validating that learning before taking any strategic action. Well, I could have shortened that down to just measure twice, cut once. Chapter eight is all about how Ryland's scientific background helps the research team back on Earth. If astrophage is complexity, this chapter is about navigating complexity and seeing the beauty in it. As a CIO, you're managing astrophage every day. When you help with prioritization, you're saying that not all complexity is equal and that your team needs to focus on what really matters most. When you focus on resilience, you're saying that astrophage complexity thrives when it doesn't have your focus. When you facilitate collaboration, you're saying that silos hinder adaptability, an important antidote to complexity. When you Demand balance. You're saying that too much energy absorption in astrophage or in business terms, over-engineering can lead to collapse. Too little engineering, not simplicity, but simplistic answers can starve growth. What I love most in this chapter is Ryland's understanding that there is beauty in complexity. It isn't inherently evil. If you know how to weave, it's the fabric of innovation, creativity, progress. So like Ryland Ship, you can embrace astrophage complexity. It can be your fuel. It can be what protects you. Uh, it might even end up being what feeds your solution, what saves you. Chapter 11 is the culmination of all the weird metaphors that I've been using to describe Ryland and Rocky. Rylan's a business user. Rocky is the engineer. Science is business knowledge. Business depth is what makes you a protagonist, not a sidekick. And astrophage is complexity. At first, in the chapter, Ryland and Rocky struggle with communicating, but they know that if they both keep struggling, they're doomed. Their planets are doomed. So they teach each other their respective languages. In our metaphorical context, it would be business jargon versus engineering jargon. And they work together to solve the astrophage problem. Again, business complexity. The HR-friendly takeaway is all about the power of diverse perspectives and mutual learning. It's about how business users and developers need to communicate effectively to align technology with business needs. But you know all that. The harder takeaway is that whoever knows more drives the narrative. The reason learning is so important is that it brings an equilibrium to an otherwise unhealthy power dynamic. If you don't understand the business as well as your business partner, they're Ryland, you're Rocky. They're the chef, you're the waiter. Learning is the equalizer. Yeah, so Ray Denzel.
Chapter 12. This is where we pretend that Rocky needing Rylan to watch him sleep is a metaphor, like something your 11th grade English teacher would force on you. If 11th grade me was writing that essay, I'd take out my thesaurus and give Mrs. Hoffman a sentence for the ages. I still remember the day she, in front of class, called me Thesaurus Rex. It was glorious, resplendent. Pompeii to her Vesuvius. One high school sentence for her. <clears throat> Should we posit that Ryland, emblematic of business users, and Rocky, the paragon of the supporting engineer, engage in a nocturnal tableau wherein Rocky, in a state of somnolence, necessitates Ryland's vigilant surveillance we encounter a narrative imbued with multifarious strata of significance. I have no idea what I just said. I'll tell you three business reasons, Mrs. Hoffman, why Rocky the Engineer had a need for Ryland, the business user, to watch over him during sleep. One, this is the body of my essay. One, the trust. Just like Rocky relies on Ryland's vigilance, engineers trust business users to provide clear requirements, guidance, and context because most engineers don't have it. They're waiters, not chefs. Footnote at the bottom. Two, vulnerability and accountability. What's more vulnerable than sleep other than maybe dedicating a TikTok to your high school English teacher? Rocky's vulnerability mirrors the engineer's position when writing software. By having Ryland watch over him, Rocky acknowledges accountability. And three, the close to last paragraph, quality assurance. Watching Rocky sleep represents QA. Ryland ensures that Rocky's actions, code, designs, decisions, meet his desired standards. The business parallel, users validate the work of engineers, what nerds call a UAT, ensuring their output aligns with the organizational needs and expectations. In summary, Mrs. Hoffman, the metaphor underscores the symbolic relationship between business users and engineers. Just as Ryland watches over Rocky, effective collaboration and mutual understanding lead to successful deliveries in the real world. Now, just let me check the word count on this. Chapter 14. And I quote, another day, another staff meeting. Who could have thought saving the world could be so boring? Staff meetings. Sometimes the stuff we all hate ends up being the only way to do things. End quote. Okay, meetings, we all hate them. And their alternative is decisions made in the dark. Decisions made behind closed doors. Decisions made when you weren't watching email or Slack like a hawk. Let me make some friends with this next statement. Even poorly run, no agenda provided, FYI only meetings are virtuous. They're the operating discipline behind a lot of important values. Inclusion, transparency, gratitude, candor. Maybe someday. Hopefully someday. We get to all that with digital-only channels. But right now, there's no better way to weave the fabric of our shared purpose to ensure that every voice is heard. Not that every voice is right, but that everyone is heard. Even Strat, who is, as I said before, the most empowered PM on the planet, needs meetings. That's how she gets to, that's how we get to, informed, focused decision-making. The best time and place to make decisions are when everyone's in the room, when everyone who is going to be impacted by that decision is there, is aligned, is committed to the decision. Even if they don't agree, at least they can disagree but commit. Meetings are paradoxical. They're time sucks that save time. They're agendaless many times, and they still somehow clarify ambiguities. They keep you from getting your work done, and without them, you'd never get your work done. Yes, they're purely informational. You could, in theory, put all that love into an email that no one will ever read. Well, one person will read and reply all with thanks. It's, it's like presenting on, on Zoom when everyone else has their camera off. Uh, and I think I'm channeling Alanis Morissette. 
I'm not even going to end this with some garbage like meetings just need to be run right, blah, blah, blah. You know, send an agenda, blah, blah. Don't include everybody, blah, blah, blah. Look, if you hate meetings, join the club, but understand their value and the giant gaping void that is their alternative. They're better than rain on your wedding day. These chapters were about using the tools you have, in Rylan and Rocky's case, what they have on their respective ships. Their plan to farm a weapon against the astrophage is really about constrained innovation, working with what you got. Let's make it about being a CIO. If you land in an organization with three of something and you need to rationalize down to one, you need to work within that box. You need to pick one of the three and retire the other two. I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of CIOs come into an org, see three tombstones, and their ideation is unconstrained. That sounds good. Let's play it out over time. CIO one arrives at their new job, they assess the application landscape, and inevitably realize that they own three redundant systems for a business capability. Obviously, they should have one. So they bring in a fourth amazing application, one that they've experienced success with, to take out the three tombstones. Fast forward two years and a lot of hard work that retires, say, 80% of the three legacy systems or recognizes the complexity error around retiring the final 20% of each of them. And bam, with year three arrives the next CIO, CIO number two, who assesses their application landscape and inevitably realizes that they own four redundant systems. Obviously, they should have only one, so they bring in a fifth to take out the four tombstones. That's why I call them that. That's the downside to unconstrained innovation. Tombstones. Constrained innovation isn't sexy, but it's about, you know, rolling up your sleeves and working with what you got. Like Ryland, you'll face immense challenges, make sacrifices, constantly make tough decisions, and hopefully learn to persevere. Because under your watch, no more tombstones. The primary lesson for me in these chapters was about sacrifice and resilience. Secondary lesson? I haven't mentioned it before, but I really love all the jumping back and forth the story does between the past and the present. We tend to use the past at work as an explanation for when all the bad decisions happened. But it's never true. All the retrospectively bad decisions I've ever found were good decisions at the time. All that technical debt that you own didn't come from uninformed decisions by a group of clowns. They were, for the most part, rational, thoughtful decisions, sometimes made by people who didn't have and couldn't have had all the information they need to make a perfect decision. They did the best they could. Okay, it's a little philosophical, but I'm getting older. If you, if you haven't figured that out yet, you know, by just looking at my sidebirds, even 50 plus years in, I look at myself 10 years ago and think, what a noob. What was I thinking 10 years ago? I don't think that ever stops. I'll, I'll be 90 someday and, and think 80 year old me was such a child. Aging or aging well is really about looking back with forgiving eyes in life and work. Like with Ryland and his arc in the book, there is a redemptive quality to the present, to getting older. We're all cowards in some way, until we're not. Just takes time. This is the final chapter of the CIO Book Club series. Okay, what leadership lessons did you learn from the final chapters, chapters 25 through 30 of Project Hail Mary? And just in case you're watching this without having finished the book, I'll keep this spoiler free. This whole journey has been an exercise in the virtues of character, the kind you need to, to make weighty decisions, the kind you need to be resilient during a crisis, the kindness you need to have a profound positive impact on the people around you. This isn't an exhaustive list of virtues that I learned from Ryland and Rocky, virtues that should be exercised by leaders at work, but let's, let's do three. Adaptability. Always be prepared for unexpected challenges and adapt quickly. Humor. One, because life would be awful without it. And two, because it makes for better stories. What else? Sacrifice. Not the human kind. Yeah. The other kind. 
it's necessary for success at work. I might even call it selflessness, but it's not something we usually talk about. All right, let's make this exhaustive because that seems like it's falling short. And it is the wrap up to the series, so we can, we can go a little bit longer. Curiosity. What would Ryland be without it? As, as a CIO, fostering curiosity is the difference between a rigid, oppressive culture and an innovative, adaptable one. Kindness. Ryland led with empathy. As a, as a leader, showing compassion and understanding is so much more powerful than the yucky alternative. Bravery. Not Earth Ryland, but Space Ryland. His kind of courage could help any CIO make tough decisions and lead fearlessly. Perseverance. I touched on this. Ryland's tenacity should be modeled by CIOs, whose job is ultimately about leading through setbacks while keeping their teams motivated. What else? Gratitude, because the hero is the team. The story would be nothing without Rocky. Fairness. Think about Strat's decision to nominate Ryland. That's about radical fairness. There's, there's been a push in business lit about radical candor, but it needs to come with radical fairness, radical equity, the radical versions of all the virtues uh, I just listed. And last, and somewhat appropriately last, humility. Ryland saved the world, but you couldn't tell by looking at him. He was, throughout the story, so open to learning and acknowledging his limits, inspirationally so. He wears, in my opinion, the best kind of cape plain and tattered. And that's probably the perfect note with which to end the series. Thanks for coming along on the read.